Tony, back in the days of Captain America Civil War, wanted there to be some kind of accountability for superheroes uh, because he was scared of the results of actions like his own and the dangers it could cause for superheroes to kind of just do what they want at all times with no kind of accountability. So um, he decided to make glasses that could kill anyone at any time. Spoiler warning. Okay, Spider-Man Far From Home, a movie that I kind of thought would just be another stop on Mr. Marvel's Wild Ride. But um, I actually had a lot of thoughts about it, the more I sort of gave it time to gestate in my brain hole. Um, but I don't really want to put it to a video. Um, I may even have a video that covers the Marvel Cinematic Universe in sort of more broad de detail. So instead what I have is a little notes document here of some hot takes and just various takeaways I have from the film. Uh, sorry this is what couldn't come sooner. I didn't know where my Marvel hat was, so. So essentially for this, I'm just gonna go through these notes here and just go point by point. Just some of the weird things that I think pop up in this movie um, and some neat stuff too, some of the stuff I liked um, and There'll be some fun, and some laughs, and some cries. <laughs> so, point number one. Uh, Peter Parker is still a teenage boy, right? A really weird thing I found in this film was a lack of acknowledgement from basically any adults that Peter was still a kid and shouldn't have any, like, real, um, like, responsibility while he's still, like, a legal minor. I think he's 16 in this movie. Um, in Spider-Man Homecoming, they make a big deal out of the fact that like he's just a kid so they don't really want to put this much onto him right now certainly in captain america civil war we had the weirdness of tony showing up at peter's place at that point peter was 14 <laughs> got a passport and uh convincing him to join him in the thing against captain america but even then it was like a very specific job they had him do and then after that they kind of saw sense and you know, honed him in a little bit. In this movie, it's like they're pushing Peter to be the next Iron Man. Like, Nick Fury is shaming him for failing to live up to that. And like, well, I guess we shouldn't have trusted you with so much responsibility. And it's like, yeah, Peter is literally given glasses that control drone strikes and the personal data of every private citizen. And he's expected to just, like, use that responsibly as a 16-year-old kid. Like, oh, he is quick to trust someone else with that responsibility. He really doesn't want that responsibility. He constantly talks about not wanting that responsibility. And yet, somehow, it's like he has done something wrong when, you know, he does a bad thing. And can we also talk a little bit about the fact that this technology even exists? Uh... Tony, back in the days of Captain America Civil War, wanted there to be some kind of accountability for superheroes uh, because he was scared of the results of actions like his own and the dangers it could cause for superheroes to kind of just do what they want at all times with no kind of accountability. So um, he decided to make glasses that could kill anyone at any time. Like, in and of itself, this doesn't seem too out of character for Tony, but the film is, like, very uh, hesitant to really put any judgments on Tony for this. He's very much treated with kids' gloves as a result of the fact that he died, I guess. Um, it's one of those situations where there's, like, tons of things to criticize him about, but the film never does. Like, should Tony have had glasses that let him drone strike anyone at any time? No, definitely not, no. The answer is no. Even if we assume that Tony only uses those glasses for good reasons, what if the glasses fall into the wrong hands like they literally do in this movie? And the idea that in like the era of Facebook and Apple, um, data protection issues abound, that a billionaire just has glasses that can get your personal information if it wants um and no one really seems to care about that it's pretty scary this is wrong <laughs> i actually had one commenter who uh, pointed out that peter getting these glasses from tony 
uh, is an example of with great power comes great responsibility. So with the great power of a billionaire illegally acquiring your personal information comes great responsibility to do no wrong with it. <laughs> Which is just the most horrific mangling of the Spider-Man moral of with great power comes great responsibility. That now we're putting that onto fucking Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I mean, this is all pretty heady stuff, and again, the movies don't. The, mo and the movie does pull back from it uh, pretty quickly and doesn't really take too much thought towards it. Peter still has the glasses, I think, I, although I do think he destroyed the drones, which um, good stuff, buddy. <laughs> the the other thing that this movie deals with is kind of a fake news narrative involving Mysterio, aka Quinton Beck, who um, spoilers it turns out he's a villain. It's a really weird contrast from Spider-Man Homecoming to this movie that in Spider-Man Homecoming there's the whole message of like, oh, Stark Industries kind of shat on these working class people which left them in a sort of desperate spot um, so they went to crime and it really helps you sort of understand that these people have been put in a shitty position by people like Tony Stark. Um, and it kind of speaks to that class divide -y type thing going on that was quite the hot topic at the time. Very good for social media engagement. But then you have this movie, which also has the motivation of the villain be that they kind of got shat on by Tony Stark. Except in this movie, it's kind of just a punchline because Quentin Beck is like seriously, like completely deranged. Um, and the movie really takes no pains to make him in, seem in any way sympathetic. He's in many ways, one of the least sympathetic Marvel protagonists in the way that he's uh, framed on screen. And he's doing all this for publicity because he's such a fame hoarder because he wanted some degree of credit for the invention that Tony Stark stole from him and other workers. You know, in universe, there's many characters there that are part of this group. So this is clearly an issue that was sort of systemic in Stark Industries of workers being kind of push down, um, you know, like what happens to in a lot of these kinds of industries. Mr. Musk, mm. how are you? Congratulations you? on the promotion. You're right. you. But again, compared to the very sympathetic approach we got for a lot of Homecoming, it really is just punchlines here and Quinton Beck being a cartoonishly bad man, which isn't necessarily bad, I guess. Um, it just feels like a weird dissonance between the movies. Uh, where it seems like they sort of dropped that theme and then moved on to this whole other one about like fake news. Although I do have to say on that note, translating the Daily Bugle to be Infowars is fucking incredible. To translate J. Jonah Jameson into Alex Jones. And yes, it's good that they got J.K. Simmons back. No one else could have played that role except maybe Terry Crews. That is something that I do hope that they actually follow up on and really deal with in the next movie. Um, I would hate to have another situation like Homecoming where it feels like they're touching on an issue of class divide and inequality and things like that, and then in the next movie it's just not really a thing or treated as a punchline. We can't really say at this point, it always sort of feels like there's a grand master plan in the Marvel Cinematic Universe where we're not really sure where it's going to go and whether there's going to be a message at the end. High end game. Incidentally, if they do go forward with the whole fake news narrative stuff going forward, the idea of a disingenuous right-wing actor framing someone they have a personal beef with and then spreading that to the public in the hopes of um, having them defamed. Um, that's James Gunn. So is the Marvel Cinematic Universe going to like tackle the cancellation of James Gunn? Um, almost certainly not, but it's fun to think about, right? <laughs> There's also kind of the third aspect of the movie, which is just the high school drama romance stuff, which is like really relatable if you're a teenager. Um, that part of the movie I just thought was like cute fun, and that did feel like it was following up on Homecoming. Um, it had a lot of those same vibes about it. More fun, rambunctious stuff with Peter and MJ and Ned and Betty and all those, and Flash. Uh, more of that, less of the 
child soldier Elon Musk bullshit. <laughs> Night Monkey was a funny joke. But those are just plot beats that I had to talk about. Um, this video is not going to be very long. I just kind of wanted to say my piece on that while it was still fresh in my mind. Like I say, there might be a denser video covering the Marvel Cinematic Universe from this channel shortly. Just a few quick things before we go. One, it's a sh it's sad that Karen didn't come back. I liked her little bonding stuff when she was like Peter's little earpiece thing in the uh, loading bay that he was stuck in for a few hours. That was nice. And then she's just gone and now there's Edith. No Hannibal Burris either. I guess he had a schedule conflict, so they replaced him with a guy from things that I've seen. I wish that they'd done a little bit more with Flash's character, but I'm hoping that that's something that comes in the next movie. It seems like maybe they're building him up to serve the same role that like the Green Goblin did. I have to give a quick shout out to say that um, the opening to this movie after the credits is easily the best opening scene in any Marvel movie, and that's something that can't be questioned. So I like the weird thing with Ned and Betty getting together, even if they end up kind of getting lost in the plot later on. I like the little cultural references that they put in as they go from place to place on their little field trip. And I'm glad that MJ has the correct opinions about objective reality.